So I'll just double check. As far as I can see, there's nobody in the waiting room. So as is our, our practice just now, we'll, we'll just start with uh, the opportunity for, for prayer, for some silent prayer and listening to a, a tazy chant. So we'll just hand over to Dermot again for this afternoon session. Thank you. Right. Um, are we doing any breakout groups, uh, Rob? We didn't have any planned, but we can do if you wish. That might be valuable for just 15 or 20 minutes. Give everybody a chance to... Um, to connect a bit with each other and just talk to each other a little bit about what the morning meant. That's Dermot, I think that's about everyone back now. Okay, yep. Right, welcome back everybody. Um, hope you had uh, fruitful conversations. Now I'm going to engage directly with you in a moment. There are just, um, of the questions that were put up earlier on, there are two that I want to give a quick response to. Um, firstly, to acknowledge there, are, there were several questions and comments around the meaning of Eucharist. Um, so that's obviously a topic that is of concern to many people, just simply to acknowledge that. 
And this comment from Cecilia, the evolutionary model honors the spirit who constantly leads us all, or leads us into all faith, and it honors the gift of, of this spirit to us in baptism and confirmation. Could any authority disagree with this? Is it fear of losing power? It's partly fear of losing power. I think it's also a desperate need to update our theology. Uh, because nowadays, I think theology done by lay people is running away ahead of the theology that most of our priests and our bishops are aware of. And about 60% of all theologians now in the Catholic Church are lay people. Um, and that's changing the whole face of theology itself. And then the other comment from Trish, um, is it your experience that the need for ecological conversion uh, from Laudato Si meets resistance from Christians or Catholics who do not see their need to convert? I think it's not just resistance, it's plain ignorance. Um, that a lot of people, a lot of people haven't read the document, a lot of people don't understand the document. Um, a lot of leaders, whether we're talking about clergy or people involved in, in faith development programs, um, have either not read it or are not familiar with it. Um, and then, of course, we have the resistance. There are pockets of resistance within the church to the vision of that document, but they're coming mainly from kind of right wing cardinals, bishops, some clergy. Um, among the people, I think it's a case that they're just not familiar with the vision of it. I think that's more what the real issue is. So over to you. And um, in formulating questions or comments, I also welcome not just individual uh, comments and, and, um, and remarks, but also a bit of feedback about things you may have talked about in your breakout groups, so that we don't lose the wisdom of some of that. And particularly if there are some questions or comments arising there. So. If somebody would like to come in, just put up a hand or give a signal of some type, and either Rob or I will pick you up, and we'll hear. Yes, iPad, go ahead. You need to, oh no, you don't, that's okay. I've asked to unmute. Paul Rose, Paul and Rose there, um, unmute yourself. If you want to speak. No, um, I want the rapture. I, I, I've, I've, just, I've just changed the setting to allow participants to unmute themselves. Right. Paul and, and Rose Monaghan are trying to come in, but they have not unmuted. Okay. That's it. There yeah. we are now. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, the very first thing that came up on uh, our, the start of our communication was on the word earthing. We all loved that word, that we right. were all earthing. Ugh. That was brilliant. And we ended up by trying to think about what we were going to go away and do. Um, right. And in lockdown, the difficulties of communicating during lockdown. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I think maybe, um, for those of us that have the privilege of having a nice garden, um, and I know it's coming to the end of the summer when we won't be doing too much planting or anything like that, but there's something about getting our hands into that earth and just familiarizing ourselves with it. Um, mm. And yeah, um, and there is something about the autumn time too, about that great cycle, which can be painful and sad in a time of lockdown to see the trees turning good, turning uh, with well, the withering leaves and the disappearing flowers and all that, but also to realize that is part and parcel of that great cycle of nature. Um, yes, indeed. I, yeah. yeah, I think these are, are some of the maybe kind of simple grounding experiences that can be helpful in internalizing more deeply that idea that we are earthlings and therein lies our sacredness. Mm. <clears throat> yes, and, and that, on that vein, um, <clears throat> I watch a television programme most Friday evenings, Monty Dawn, um, it's a gardening programme. Mm. And in particular last night, um, 
he took us, he takes us to other people's gardens. And one lady's garden he took us to, she had created it along with her husband. She suffered great problems with depression and mental health. And her garden has, has caused her to, I'm not say recover, but assist her and help her spiritually by creating this garden. And when you're talking about touching the earth, there was another part of the program that showed you um, how they discovered all the small living creatures that um, live deep in the soil and help break down um, de debris to um, make um, compost. Mm. And the whole program is done so beautifully in terms of the uh, beauty of the gardens you see, the number of people who, because of lockdown, have, are getting some spiritual um, feelings about nature, about being outside and working with the soil and plants. That I've always been interested in that. It's something I absolutely, yeah. I absolutely love. And um, I very much relate to that in terms of the spiritual feeling I get when I'm, when I'm in, uh, you know, when I'm with, I feel I'm with the spirit when I'm out in my garden and when I'm out in the countryside. And there's a lot to be said for that. Thank you for that. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. Can I now, okay. Question, please. Yeah. Dermot, you, you said about a baby not being born into the world. Could you elaborate a wee bit on that for us? Um, I think it's a simple fact that, um, well, it's not simple, it's quite complex and quite rich and deep. Everything in, in our bodies um, that we have has been given to us by some process going on in the wider web of creation itself. So for instance, carbon is, is a basic chemical that's, that's, that's core and central to all life forms. Without mm -hmm. it, we would not be alive. The carbon that we carry around in our bodies has been given to us from dying stars. That's where we get it from. And therefore the whole idea that we're one with the stars. So all, the, all that kind of psychic energy all that's out there in the universe then gets, gets channeled as it were into the loving relationship of our parents and through their procreative process is passed on to each one of us through what happens to us and how we come into the world. Um, another nice little story, which will give you a sense of what I'm talking about. And I was first taught this by a midwife in the Philippines. Um, and it's now apparently, um, you can check it out. It's, it's kind of standard science now. What they have discovered is that when the baby is developing in the womb, there are a number of chemicals that must be very finely balanced. And they are in the vast majority of cases. Otherwise, the child will be born with some abnormalities. One of those chemicals is salt. And what they have discovered is that the saline consistency or the strength of the salt in the mother's womb during a healthy pregnancy, which fortunately is true in most cases, what they have discovered is that the consistency in that salt is almost identical with the consistency of salt in the surrounding oceans. Now, that means that a woman uh, who is pregnant in the Philippines will be picking up the salt consistency of the China Sea. But a woman pregnant in New York will be getting the salt consistency or a matching of it in the western part of the Atlantic Ocean, which is going to be slightly different from that of the China Sea. Uh, and this happens right across the planet. So it's, it's that amazing interconnection that we all have all the time, not merely with the earth, but with the wider creation. And therefore each one of us is a kind of an icon of what goes on in creation. It, it opens up the mystery of the human person in a whole new light. Yeah, yeah. I think Christine's going to come in just now. Yes, thank you. Um, dear Mud, one thing is I just feel released um, to carry on 
exploring and and trusting my um, intuitions and talking with people. This is really important that we get this kind of sense of being sent to carry on doing this. Sure. The other thing is, as Laudato Si also um, explains, we we need to work with so many different agencies that are have got the same idea or the same vision, mm. not just the church or Christians or anything else, but loads of other people who aren't maybe believers, but who are concerned about yeah. the same issue. Uh, we need to we need to think like this. We need to be doing this, reaching out and connecting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's like Albert Nolan in South Africa said to me many years ago when I was having a conversation with him about justice making. He said, the issues today, many of the major issues facing us are too big for any of us individually. And yet we all have something to contribute. So we need to join networks. Yeah. And the, the, the discernment then is what network or networks should we join? Um, and the other comment, because most of us on the on this program today, like most of the empowering people in our world today, are over the age of 70 and are in our older years. In that context, I think we need to remember that as of this year, 2020, we have more people on the planet over the age of 60 than under 16 for the first time ever. We have more people on the planet now over the age of 60 than under 16 for the first time ever, according to the United Nations. From here on, elders are going to be critically important to the dissemination of wisdom. Mm. And so we, we all have the potential and the call to become wise elders. <laughs> and let's embrace it and not feel embarrassed about it. Yeah. <laughs> is, is, is Biddy, Biddy Gray? Yes. Yes. Did you yeah. have a question? No. Oh, I saw you unmuted, so sorry. Dan, are you willing? Uh, could, uh, yes, I, I'll make a comment, Rab. Um, Dermot, I was, um, well, you're, you're unpicking, or beginning to unpick, the encyclical is utterly fascinating. And what I was um, hearing from you was the kind of thing we get from David. Is it David Dimbleby, the man of uh, the... the uh, uh, nature, the uh, yes. BBC. Yes. Yes. He, he is all about uh, this integration uh, and the danger that the earth is in. And I was uh, delighted that, um, uh, that there's a, a contrary understanding to what he fears in, in religion, that the Christianity was all about subduing and dominating the earth. Yeah. Uh, th mm -hmm. that, that understanding is uh, out the window, and thank God for that. I think that is a, mar a, a masterly um, uh, explanation that we've had from uh, Pope Francis uh, on on the uh, on the meaning of creation and our mm -hmm. place in it. Yeah. Yes, that that phrase from the Book of Genesis, I'm told, is even bad Hebrew. It's not honouring the true uh, translation mm -hmm. at all of the Hebrew. It, it became more the translation that that was conveyed to us through the Greek. Um, and so even to get back to a more foundational meaning of Genesis itself um, would lead us more into understanding our role as carers and stewards mm. rather than masters or controllers. Yes. Catherine, I think, wants to come in. Um, yes. Dermot, just your last... Um, comments there on, um, as I call us all, the Grey Brigade. Um, yes, I think we have to be um, wisdom figures. And I think we need to be very careful that we're not excluding the young. Okay. Because that is the future. And it's the way we are. I think we need to be, you know, uh, and uh, I, 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 um, hesitate to say it because I, I don't see myself as a wisdom figure at all. But I think we have a bit of life experience, but we must engage with the youth in a way that is 20th century. So they, 
we must listen to them so they'll help us be in mm -hmm. the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And one of the thoughts I had during lockdown was, what if we helped young people, and it doesn't matter whether they belong to any church or not. I'm thinking about my local council here. Nice. I know a, a part of the town where they could, the, the, the young people could be engaged in what was the old, um, you know, uh, um, plot uh, um, to grow things. Help mm -hmm. me somebody with the word we call it. A, a garden of no, not the garden. creativity. Allotment. 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 Now, what if they were, they were helped and we, without stuffing religion at them, but actually brought this message. I think the message from Francis, in my thinking, is for the whole world. Mm -hmm. And if we started with the young people, a suggestion or get to our councils or whatever. I mean, they've, they've done it beautifully in uh, um, uh, Lauriston, but not with young people so much. And I would like to see us think about how we might encourage them to start their own growing patches, especially for groups that live in flats. I absolutely felt guilty during lockdown when i look at the lovely garden i was in that that kept me sane mm -hmm. and thought of parents and with young children in flats we have to do something practical and the young people might feel then um they they belong to the earth in the way we, we would like them to think and yeah sure a, oh, absolutely yeah i mean i i i i i'm certainly aware of the danger of ageism, so to speak. And um, my concern, I suppose, around the older sector of the population is particularly in most of our Western countries, our old people are dismissed as irrelevant, as useless, non-productive, non all these kind of ideas. Um, and particularly with the world population growing older, um, mm. I think, I think we, we have to work towards an integration, but I agree yes. with you, ideally an integration right across the board, yes. Yes, yeah. Anthea, did you have a, a question or comment? Yeah, hi, Rab. Um, it was just that the group we, that I was in, we, we, were, we all realized we were kind of talking the same language um, and we had the same sort of feeling about it all and we were excited about what we've been hearing uh, during the morning. And so, first of all, it was a thank you for giving us this opportunity of coming together. But also, um, I, I worked with young people, uh, well, until I was very old. And um, they are very enthusiastic. But somehow, uh, some people feel that it's their job to keep these young people in their place. And... and um, Dermot has given us all this opportunity to go to young people because if you get them enthusiastic like Greta Somberg has become, or I can't remember her proper surname, um, they, they take off and you, you can look at them and whether they say they're Christians or not, you mm -hmm. can see God at work in them. Um, and I particularly, for one, I... I didn't uh, leave work at the right time, but I but I left to do um, a degree on ecological sustainability. And our church had, well, not just our church, all the churches ha um, have investments in fossil fuel and they hadn't a clue. <laughs> you, you know, you had to sort of go, excuse me, you're investing in fossil fuels. Um, but they didn't understand this morning gave us a brilliant opportunity to see things from a different point of view as well. Mm -hmm. And it was really exciting. And for me, I actually really knew what the language was all about. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks, thank you. Anthea. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you very much. And do you want to come in? You've yes, got your I hand do. up. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Um, 
Anne, Anne Burnett. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Right. Um, I just want to say the thing about attracting the young. I think in many ways I'd like to reverse that. I mean, we've seen the climate change strikes in, in, well, in Scotland anyway, that the young are teaching us. Yes. You know, we don't yeah. really need to attract them. That's what you said, Anthea. It's more that we went to a couple of those climate change strikes to observe because it was their strike. And I was humbled by the amount of enthusiasm, the knowledge that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much about us attracting them. Let's go where they are because they've got it. And it's not just kids from middle class backgrounds, it's kids from all backgrounds who are passionate yes. about this. And yeah. I think I'm, rather than us bringing them to us, let's go to them. Yeah. And Greta Thunberg is just one example of somebody that has certainly inspired a lot of young people right across the board, as you say. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Is David Jackson, David oh. Jackson Senior, actually. Oh, hello, yes. <laughs> I have a son called David Jackson as well, which is a bit of art, you know. Anyway, it's a question to uh, Dermot. Um, thank you for your uh, input this morning. Brilliant. Um, it's a question about networking and the discernment of networks. Um, I, uh, the, there's a thing that you, you, you've heard of Extinction Rebellion, and there are Christians for uh, climate action. And news at the weekend that Father Martin uh, Newell, the passionist mm. priest, was arrested for sitting on the pavement outside Westminster. So it's non-violent, uh, civil disobedience. And I'm just wondering if, it, it, have you any question marks over that or any thoughts about it? Um, it's a, it is a question of discernment and also the idea that time is short um, and right. all our personal efforts and individual efforts and even in, in little networks and parishes and allotments will go so far. But unless governments act, we're in deep trouble. So I just wonder what you think about uh, Extinction Rebellion. Well, I think, to, I think there's a number of bits to, to your question, and, and it's very well formulated. Um, yeah, there is the whole issue of discernment. And firstly, I think when we're dealing with networks, one of the great values of networks, and also one of the risks maybe of networks, networks of their very nature are spontaneous, and they need to be. Um, they're all very open, they're very fluid, they allow for a lot of creativity, but they also need some good leadership. And the, the challenge, of course, is that it's, it's leadership that has to come from the ground up. If you try to impose a patriarchal leadership on them, um, you, you'll destroy them fairly quickly. So, for instance, um, peace and justice networks, and this has been acknowledged uh, in, in many spheres, tend to attract very angry people. Yeah. And yeah. usually the group does not have the skills to handle them very well which is a pity, because their anger is the single greatest gift they're bringing. It's the anger that gives them the resilience to, to, to stand up, to fight their way through, to hear, to make their voice heard, and in a sense, to, to kind of bombard parliamentarians who, are as, who try to keep themselves as deaf as they can, particularly to these kind of protesting people. So the network, yeah, networking is a very exciting concept but it's not the easiest of ones to manage. Um, we do need skills to manage it um, because there will be a lot of very strong emotions around. Um, now, I think, I think networks achieve two things. Number one, going back to my statement this morning, when I change the level of my awareness, I start attracting a different reality. I think they're powerful for raising awareness. And um, if and when they can get true to governments, great, but even if they don't get through to governments, I think for the sake of our civilization, for the sake of a more sustainable world, they're still offering something hugely important. Um, so for instance, um, about, I, I think it was, um, I'm trying to think of his name in Friends of the Earth, and I'm having a senior moment. He's um, Jonathan. Or it's Pollitt. Pollitt, was it Pollitt? Yes, it, it, yeah. just the man. Yeah. Now, he made the observation, I think it's about 20 years ago, that when governments first began drawing up an ecological policies, our policies around the environment, because he was deeply involved in Friends of the Earth, he noticed that the language was fairly similar across several governments. And then he made the connection fairly quickly. They all had borrowed the language from Greenpeace. So all these governments overtly hate Greenpeace 
and condemn them to hell. But yet they were all borrowing their language when they were trying to drop their own policies. In other words, the wisdom of the network was penetrating, even though none of these governments were admitting it. So it's, yeah, your, your, your question is, is absolutely apt. And I think that the, the short answer to your question is, it is about discernment, but it's not the kind of discernment we just do down on our knees with our own individual spiritual directors. It's, it's about more meaningful, responsible conversations. Um, and also a group acquiring some of those skills that are needed to handle these very high powered people which can be the greatest gift of all to the group, provided the group has the skills to integrate them. Thank Cecilia Snape, could you, would you have a question? Well, my hand isn't up, but I have a comment, if I may. Sure. Uh, following what you just said there, Dermot, you set me off thinking. Um, first of all, <clears throat> perhaps it's the nature of the subject which causes the difference when we have this uh, uh, overt networking. CAFOD could arrange, CAFOD Christian Aid, Oxfam, they could arrange these demonstrations attracting thousands of people who walked uh, down Whitehall to Westminster, uh, made their point by their very appearance, banners, they did lobby some MPs. There was no um, law breaking, there was no trouble, there's no anything. But it's very powerful. Yeah. Then you switch to the uh, climate issue and you've got all these terrific young people and others who get themselves invaded by these very militant left-wing anarchists who take mm -hmm. over. Yeah. yeah. And it's been happening in student bodies on the continent. Mm -hmm. It's, I've nothing more to say that, than just point out that isn't that happening, isn't it? It's an, it's an interesting fact. My second point is, what, in your last remark, Damon, this, um, this, this networking uh, of two examples I've, I've just made, keeps the issue alive before the rest of the population because the media right. report it. Yep. So mm -hmm. the, the issue of, uh, you know, not using plastic bags and whatnot was kept alive by the demos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, can we extend that to the sort of networking we were talking about within specifically Christian circles? Yeah. Uh, that the networks we form, because these matters, various matters are being discussed, we'd have to report them somehow, is keeping the topics alive before the, um, uh, I hesitate to say hierarchy or the, the more traditional mm -hmm. elements in the church. And I think that's, and that's where my comment, you know, about if we keep the, at the end of the day, the action will follow the consciousness. And hopefully even in a small way, and more importantly, through networking, if we can all contribute to raising that consciousness, I think sooner or later that will make a difference. And certainly that's where my hope rests. Rob, I'm going to take one more, if there is one more comment or question. I, Rosa's got her hand up very politely. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, two things. Firstly, thanks, Dermot, for today. I and mean, I feel that you've articulated my story in the church and in activism as well. So thank you. It's brilliantly articulated and, and lived out, I think, too, by you. The other thing I wanted to say was coming back to young people again. Um, I mean, I, I'm lucky in that I see young people in schools quite a lot, right from five years old through to 18 and also work with teachers. And one of the great things in Scotland, and it's a real sign of hope for me, is that it is a requirement in Scotland uh, that every teacher teaches either outdoors or and is committed to learning what we've called learning for sustainability. But that's all about interdependence with the planet, with nature, our own survival, about ecology, everything. Now it's been on the go for about the last five, six years and it has grown enormously in our schools through education and I just find it incredible to go into schools and I hear five, six year olds talking with each other about sustainable development goals. I hear them talking about it, raising awareness to themselves, then they go back home to their families and annoy them with it all and challenge some of their um, behaviours and lifestyles 
And then on top of that, they're also thinking about action. So it's talking about it, being educated in the challenges that face our world, and then thinking, okay, how can we fix this? And I've been blown away by their, their discussions. And that's right across Scotland, I've seen children talking about this, and I've seen young adults who then tell me that they are members of other groups now. You know, climate change, they're taking part in the climate strikes. And for me, I just found it incredibly inspiring, hopeful to listen to them, but also to say, look, do you know what? I need to come and join you. Yeah, yeah. So that again is the consciousness. I think we're catching up. And thank God Laudati C has actually enabled most of us adults to catch up and realise how important this is right across the world. So, do you know, I've, I've got lots of hope um, yeah, yeah. in them. And now what you're saying is another example of the consciousness leading to proaction, yeah. if you like. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, friends, I have a short bit of input to give before we conclude the day, because it feels important that we should link all this in with the coronavirus, seeing that it's such a major sign of our times. So I'm going to present that very briefly. You don't have a handout for it. It's just a few slides, which I'm going to bring up in a moment and talk about them. there's no problem. It's when they're put under pressure or when they're, when they're misused and abused, then it breaks out to their bodies, is passed on to other creatures, and eventually ends up with us humans. And this man, David Quammen, who is an American uh, scientist, wrote about all this back in 2012 in the light of his visit to China and elsewhere in the world. And Barack Obama, as American president, was trying to draw the attention of the American people to this forthcoming pandemic. And of course, nobody chose to listen to him. He writes in the book, I was there during one of the periods of suppression of the wild animal trade after the 2003 czars outbreak. But frogs were still legal. Turtles were still legal. I didn't see bats, but I saw a ton of wild birds of all sorts that had been captured, not for pets, but for food and all caged in a great jumble with water flowing and blood flowing and butchery happening in a pretty unhygienic environment. And then later in the book, he widens it out from this phenomenon called the spillover, whereby the virus is passed on, to looking at the disturbance of habitats around the world, particularly in the Amazonian forests. We start cutting down trees for timber. We build timber camps. We build mining camps. We harvest the wild animals further to feed the laborers in the timber camps and the mining camps. And we capture the wild animals and ship them away alive or dead to be consumed by other people elsewhere. Doing all that, we disrupt those wild ecosystems or those natural ecosystems and once again contribute to viruses like the one we're dealing with. Vandana Shiva, whom some of you may know, um, a great activist in India. Science is informing us that we, that as we invade forest ecosystems, destroy the homes of species and manipulate plants and animals for profits, we create conditions for new diseases. Over the past 50 years, 300 new pathogens have emerged. It is well documented that around 70% of the human pathogens, including AIDS, HIV, Ebola, influenza, MERS and SARS, emerge when forest ecosystems are invaded and viruses jump from animals to humans. When animals are cramped in factory farms for profit maximization, new diseases like swine flu and bird flu begin to spread. So 
Earlier in the lockdown, everybody was talking about the new normal. And unfortunately, it's gone off the air almost completely. And so we're stuck still with an old normal. And I would hope that the vision we're exploring today would be the catalyst to try and bring us back or at least direct us towards a new normal. The new normal has now been, ex has now been identified with mere external actions. Social distancing, wearing masks, respiratory hygiene, washing hands, restricted numbers, working from home and waiting for a vaccine. There's no focus put on internal dispositions, that more deeply reflective, integrative approach that we've been looking at today. So changing the causes of the spillover, how do we help to become more aware that is we ourselves are probably giving us this, this virus through our um, uh, reckless, irresponsible behavior. What can we do to try and change the consciousness around the awful things that happen when we disrupt organic habitats? Our failure to listen to nature's warnings. Somebody has said that coronavirus is like a kick in the teeth that nature is giving us, telling us to wake up and cop on how we are behaving. I know I'm talking today to the converted, but once again, it's about how do we change consciousness in the hope that the action then will begin to change um, in the troubled parts of our world. A more empowering economic system. Millions of people are now suffering in a terrible way economically because the capitalistic system is not robust enough to help people through in times like this pandemic. And Pope Francis himself said this in a talk he gave uh, to a group in Italy on Easter Sunday of this year, encouraging governments around the world to rethink the whole notion of a basic living wage for everybody, a more socialistic approach to our economics. Towards a new work ethic, yes, a lot of people are now working from home and it's sparing our roads and our environments, but there is a great danger that once the pandemic moves through and we arrive at a vaccine, that many workplaces will be requiring people to come back because the research shows that productivity tends to be a bit higher when people are, are in the workplace together. And unfortunately, again, the standard work ethic is all about productivity and fails to look at some of the other more wholesome factors. Fostering healthy immunity, for me, this is one of the massive disappointments um, in this whole approach to the pandemic. Nobody is talking about how do you build up a healthy immunity? It's all about waiting for the vaccine, as if the vaccine is going to be the golden solution, when in fact it won't. The role of religion has been quite poor in all this. Uh, we haven't come up with any real new challenging and imaginary insights. And so therefore, in my opinion, there is no new normal. We are in danger of reverting to an old normal. And so we have to keep the consciousness moving in the hope once again of moving us in the direction of something that will be healthier and more wholesome for everybody and for our planet. Charles Eisenstein, you can look up his name on the internet, um, a very powerful American philosopher um, and a real justice seeker. Human beings have been committing horrors for thousands of years in the name of conquering evil. Um, and then he says, the state of interbeing, that's where we all begin to interact in more proactive, creative ways. It is the vulnerability of the naive altruist, of the trusting lover, of the unguarded sharer. To enter it, one must leave behind the seeking shelter of a control-based life, protected by walls of cynicism, judgment, and blame. Okay, so the major challenges. How do we learn to live more responsibly as earthlings? I think the virus is throwing that question back at us very loud and clear. How do we learn to live convivially with all the other creatures that share the planet with us? Justice and health immunity, that creating a virus, for example, I worked in the AIDS HIV scene back in the early 90s, in which we got the retroviral drugs for AIDS HIV, which have certainly helped to contain that virus. But here we are 30 years later, 
and we still don't have a cure for AIDS HIV. I think all this hope that we're placing on a vaccine is a false hope. It's, 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 it's a short-term solution. The long-term solutions are what is now coming up here on the screen in front of you. How do we be begin to recreate a new work ethic whereby we're not judging people and their work efforts purely or exclusively on productivity? What would a new economic system look like that would be based on greater justice and a sense of empowering people? And then finally, how do we reclaim a culture of people's empowerment and how people begin to mutually empower one another? And a lot of that would be the networking that we have talked about during this session. So I'm leaving you with these four kind of guidelines at the heart of Laudato C and central to the reflections that we've been looking at today. We are earthlings, not with a story of 2,000 years, but a story of 7 million years, in which we got it right for most of the time because we remained very close to nature. I write about that in my book, Ancestral Grace. Secondly, ours is a derived form of aliveness. We derive our being, our sense of being alive from the greater creation. We don't have the permission, nor the, mon nor the monopoly, to lord it over everything else. Thirdly, our primary role is to be egalitarian cooperators and not brutal competitors. And lastly, we must shed our religious arrogance with its strong patriarchal vice. And on that note, friends, I have to leave it and hold it there. I'm going slightly over the time. So if you just bear with me and with us now, I'm going to hand back to Rob and he's going to bring the day to a conclusion. Thanks so much, Dermot. I'm, I'm now going to hand over to Anne Havard, who has the most amazing task of just trying to put in some words or thanks to you. Is Anne there? I am there, yes, indeed. <laughs> well, Dermot, this morning, Rab described today as a day of oasis. And an oasis is a place of rest. But yeah. my impression, Dermot, is that you don't do rest. You do more blessed unrest. And that has certainly, you have certainly G'd us up, if you like, today. Because an oasis is also a place to gather refreshment and strength to go forward on the journey. And so much of what you've said affirms that at least we're going in the right direction. We've still got a long way to go. The thing that's most struck me about your presentations is the clarity of your exposition, that you can put so much into just a simple diagram, like your arc of transition, which I'm sure lots of us recognize as being the journey of our life. That's the journey that we are on. So on behalf of us all, Dermot, I would like to thank you so much for everything you have given us today. It's going to take us some time to process it all, but I think you must realize from the comments that you've seen so far that people have been really very, very appreciative. So from all of us, thank you very, very much. And I'd also like to thank Rab, who organized this whole session um, and has had to mastermind the technology as well today. And I was so glad that he made that slip up at the beginning because at least it shows that he's human. I was beginning to doubt that fact. And now before we say goodbye to you, Dermot, we would like to say a prayer with you if you are willing to join in us with that. Sure, thank you. Loving God, we thank you for the gift and prophetic insight of Dermot. We thank you for what he has shared with us today. We ask that you anoint him anew with your spirit, such that your life may be deepened within us. 
We pray for all of us gathered here today. May we have the wisdom to see the spirit at work in all of creation. Open our minds and hearts to be a truly discerning people that are energized by the same spirit to be a new people for a new world. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dermot, Anne. Uh, two, two further events that are coming up that continue uh, following on from our journey of discernment and assembly. The, it, one, a couple of the areas that came up that, as we said, the, the speakers in many cases stuttered over a wee bit. You know, the response that uh, they couldn't articulate fully about being women in the church. And so we'll have a conversation with Tina Beatty on the 8th of October. And then we'll have a conversation with Father James Allison on being LGBTI in the church. Uh, both areas, as I've said, that came up and need a conversation. So, and, and said it so beautifully to thank you, Dermot, uh, and thank everyone who's participated. And God bless, and we hope to see you soon. I should have said at the beginning, the, the sessions are being recorded um, and we'll get the recordings out to you as soon as we possibly can. So thanks very much again and God bless and stay safe. Thank you very much, Rob.